just in that crazy, just sort of real bad headspace. And I'd think about it and think about it and think about it. And it wasn't until I was like, well, this has been happening for a couple of weeks now. I'm not going to do anything as bad as this is. What do I do? And I was like, I just need to tell a friend. I was it. I just need to tell somebody. That's Corey Boutwell. He's a very different man to who he was not all that long ago. I'd wake up in the morning. I don't want to be here. I'd be driving to work. I don't want to be here. I'd get to work and be like, I don't want to be doing this. These days, Corey's a professional fitness model, a high performance coach, and a content creator dedicated to building and promoting all aspects of health. If you just closed your eyes and you pictured the best version of yourself, in terms of just what does he look like and what does he do? I'm assuming majority of men would close their eyes and they'd be like, well, he'd be fit. He'd look responsible. He'd look competent and strong. He'd be a man of his word. And he'd be a man of his word. Corey was diagnosed with depression at 16 and spent much of his teenage years in a fog. Things spiraled in his early 20s when he found himself unable to break out of being suicidal, hiding it from everyone until he told the right person. When you start going down the dark side, it's very easy to keep going. Yeah. And especially if you don't take any responsibility. And that's essentially what I was doing. Corey used to wake up and go to sleep not wanting to be here. Now all he wants is more time to live the life he's built. No man is free who's not a master of himself. Welcome to Young Blood, an award-winning podcast on a mission to make the mental health of young men a top priority. My name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is our platform to open up and share stories of what we've been through because we're not alone. Let's do it. Before we kick this off, I just want to say thanks so much to everyone who's taken 15 to 90 seconds out of their day to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. It boosts us up the ranks massively and makes a huge difference to how many people we can reach with these potentially life-saving stories. So thank you. And for those who haven't got around to it, please, if Youngblood has delivered you some value, let us know on there. Cheers, legends. This episode is sponsored by Bolton Brothers, the guys dedicated to changing the face of men's mental health, and Ski for Life, the organisation promoting mental health and suicide prevention through their annual ski relay in South Australia. Check out their websites and follow them on socials. Trigger warning, if you find anything spoken about in today's episode distressing, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. Corey, what was your experience of having depression as a teenager? It started off pretty early. Uh, parents, I think like a lot of men as well and just people in in general have gone through anxiety and depression. I think we all get it and it's all just a, a symptom of whatever we're suffering at the time. Yeah, and of course there's levels to it. but 100%. So at 15, at 15 parents split up and um, like... It's like 80% of people experience Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's <laughs> at least crazy. 50. It's like 50, 60, yeah. Something crazy. And I remember at that time, my mum went through a bit of uh, trouble because her dad passed away at the same time. And essentially I lived in a house with my sister and my mum and mum was like a like mental breakdown because she had like marriage was splitting up. Yeah. Dad passed away. Cataclysmic like, events, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was 15 and super uh, emotional at that age and I was mm. being brought up to be like a superstar because I was singing and dancing and acting right. for like my whole life. So I was like very put on a pedestal and thought I was the tits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the whole kind of world just like come crashing down and it wasn't until we went and saw like a psychologist at that age when they're like, oh, you've got depression and you'll move in with your dad mm. in like seven, eight months. And I was like, fuck that guy. Like, no way. And... <laughs> Six months later, moved in. But I remember being at that age and like doing the whole like run away from home and right. like uh, emotional. How did that go? <laughs> didn't, stay out for, didn't stay out for long. No. <laughs> it's pretty mean on those streets. I think I lasted like a night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's cold out there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I think it was just like s- s- standard emotional stuff. And then it sort of led to outletting it in other areas. Mm. So, Instead of, I mean, as a kid, there's so many different ways you could go about things, but like I would spend all of my time at the beach. I would spend all of my time at like far away from home as much as possible. I had savings in like a bank account that I had from singing, dancing and acting because I was working at like a real young age. And I just burned through all of that to party, mm. to spend time with people that didn't really matter but didn't know anything different yeah and a lot of those different parts out of the maturing process of coming into a man sort of stuck for a while and had to unravel all of those just trying to detach yourself basically from your environment 100 percent. and during that time uh as soon as finishing school because that happened with like a year and a half and then finishing school at 16 i was i was like fed 
into my brain like oh you're going to grow up to be this like you know famous actor and a singer or dancer or something like that lose opportunities so you fully embodied that fully embodied it well i identified with it mm. and then i went to working into a metal sheet metal shed with my dad which he was happy to have me on but he had crazy high expectations and the guys that worked there weren't the best of role models like right. yeah. and it was like a sweaty work shed in like a very toxic and masculine you couldn't get more different to the stage <laughs> really like yeah. the theater pretty uh it's pretty different yeah so it was a real big sort of shake up just in terms of what i was actually doing and like it rocked me for a while i had no idea like i completely lost all purpose I had well, no what idea was what was your doing. relationship like with your dad so before before working with dad it was really good working with dad in the steel shed it was like super toxic because he had all these expectations and i didn't meet up to him probably did for the first couple of weeks and then i was like oh i really don't want to like do this in terms of just sheer amount of work to get done yeah well he wanted me to be like him and he was known as like the success that he got was purely from hard work and it was the you know i remember one time like i got frustrated punched something broke my hand and he was like well we got to keep on working and, like my hand was completely broke like shattered and he right. was like you did that to yourself that's your own fault we got this job to finish like suck and it up his first reflex wasn't like care about my son it was <laughs> no like, way <laughs> i was like you did this to yourself it's your fault like oh, um um and that wasn't like you know he, he didn't understand like all the psychological things that happened you know with the stress at work and all the different pressures and stuff and it was like i remember or everyone else i would always think i'd play the victim but i didn't know how to get out of the mindset i had no idea about mental health and stuff mm. like that mm. so i'd play the victim of I'm in this position of having to work longer hours than everyone else, work harder than everyone else. I was like at work early, cleaning all the toilets, scrubbing all the shit. I was, you know, people had TAFE days and they'd be like, oh, we got this thing, whatever. Or people had school holidays and all these different things. So it was very much like, this is so unfair. <laughs> it felt like it was unfair. Yeah. Um, he was just trying to teach me a lesson. I didn't understand at the time. He was just trying to like, you know, hard work will pay off because that's yeah. what worked for him. He was trying to like Mr. Miyagi you. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So he's trying to Mr. Miyagi me um, at that time. And it just didn't work and it just started rubbing off because, you know, I wouldn't perform at work because stress and all these other different things. And then we'd get home and we'd hold that together and then we'd just be screaming and yelling at each other at home. Mm. And we'd get to work and then we'd all be screaming and yelling at work and it just didn't stop. And we were just like almost facing off. Like, yeah, so you're on edge all the time. On edge all the time. And it was in this fear response and like it's got like, you get sort of really lethargic over a period of time of just being mm. exposed to that. It's not like... It was crazy, but it was just like the consistency of it through years, mm. like a big shock. Kind of like that walking on eggshells type, that that tension, and mm -hmm. then feeling stuck, I suppose, as well. Yeah. Where it's like, well, I can't change my situation right now, so I don't really care. There was no room for growing. There was no independence. Mm. Um, it was all, you know, super relying on dad. I had to do these. Where else would money come from otherwise? Um, he, like, sort of, like, made me to pay for things at an early age so I could understand all these different things and it was like okay i get that makes sense but like i didn't know what to do i didn't know where to go like that was like super young and what about your relationship with your mum at that time so relationship with mum was great um sort of until i moved back in with her at early years of early 20s and i was a responsible young man and she was trying to mum me yeah. and she had a whole lot of traumas and stuff that she hadn't healed. So then we just ended up. And did you move in with her because you wanted to get more freedom that way? Not really. So I moved back in with mum purely because she had a good offer set up for uni. Um, and I could like actually do decent uni work <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when I couldn't with my old man because he didn't have the setup. He didn't value those type of things. And the whole mm. acting dream, what happened to that? So yeah, that all just went down the hole. What do you put that down to? It was sort of like the whole grow up, you got to get a job sort of mentality. You know, you got to work hard, you got to grow up, get a job, you can't get money unless you're working. And it wasn't until I started doing things like this yeah. when it was like, oh, you can, you know, do anything you really want to. Did your parents believe in the acting dream though? Well, mum did. Yeah. So mum and dad sort of did. Dad didn't really believe in any of the stuff that like, um, it was me and dad's relationship was really toxic until I won my first bodybuilding competition. It was toxic out of love. After a while, I understand that he just wanted the best me and he wanted to teach me the real good lessons, but he didn't know how to do it in a certain way, which was you no know, super kind and caring. He Maybe he had a rigid view of how you could achieve success and felt like you had to follow the same 
path that he did 100%. and that anything outside of that wasn't going to work. And I guess it's probably based on love and wanting your son to be okay and being fearful that the path they're going down is not going to work for them. But it doesn't really feel like that. It doesn't. And at the, at the time, like it almost ruined our relationship, like straight up. We almost like, like I remember him one day just like literally breaking down in tears, like at home. Like he just like sat on the edge and we'd been st- screaming and fighting and he was just like i can't do this anymore because you weren't thinking about his perspective either no and like why would you is a kid like at that age you know early 20s and it's late it's all teenage, about me and me, like my me, life's me. so hard yeah. yeah you don't you don't consider anything for your dad and, and his mental health mm. like at that time he was he was fucked he was working extremely hard he's trying to pay all of these things because the divorce machine is is hectic mm. and and was trying to like provide and support for me and my sister and all these things and run like a a business and he had all these things coming out of different ways and and felt like you were throwing it in his face and then i was i was literally i yeah. sort of was throwing it in his face unconsciously but i was but that wasn't a fault of mine and it wasn't a fault of his it's just that what like i wanted to do was different than what his expectations uh, for me were yeah and he like yeah completely full breakdown and I remember being really numb and when that happened and I was just like serves you fucking right mm. like that real like nasty edge oh to it. I was yeah. so nasty man for like no reason either and it wasn't until I reflected on that because we've talked about this um like over the past few years and sort of like we'll figured it out um but yeah it wasn't until I reflected on it until I was like oh man like I was in a bad spot there but that anger either. that anger came from the divorce happening in the first place i was really resentful yeah um i was real resentful that the whole like situation happened um and it took a little while of you know just accepting it and understanding like you know as you grow up and start to get a little bit older and you start maturing as you start understanding the difference between men and women and you start understanding people's understanding people's desires and what happens and people have fall in and out of love and how it all happens but and also probably your dad's background like how he was raised as well and then you have more compassion for that you like look back and you're like oh well he ended up thinking and feeling this way because his dad was a certain way and I think that's often the case as well and we um never we were I remember us having conversations about about all of this and reflecting on the stuff and he was like, I would never have a conversation with this, like with my dad, mm. like yeah. ever. I was yeah. like, how good is it that we can? Yeah, he's it like, is. this is the best, like, thank God. Yeah, and, and funny realising that, and my dad's the same, that that's a big thing that they always wanted and probably resentful that they were never able to have and that that would be this, the story for so many who... Uh, dads, their dads, for guys our age now, they all experienced that where it was like in tough tough love maybe they don't even say i love you or or show any sort of affection and certainly don't talk about like the real deep stuff and so there's like this pre yearning for that but i guess they just shut it down because they're told to and then and then they don't want to well they're going to repeat it with their son possibly because they don't know how to deal with that unless they're able to sort of push past it but. I dude i couldn't agree anymore um yeah, like I hug and kiss my dad and tell my dad I love him all the time. How does he, how's he go with that? <laughs> oh, no, he loves it. He does it. He's the lover. He comes yeah. up to me and he's like, give me your dad a kiss. Like, uh-huh. and I'm like, no, man, <laughs> get off me. How did it, How did but, you make that transition? Well, it was just, he's just a super lover, like lover type of person. Mm. But I do, I do talk to a lot of people and they're like, how do you like, it happened. Like my dad's like, we never have any sort of relationship like mm. that. And it wasn't until, you know, we understood that like, for me, myself had to make a connection of my dad needs me to show him love. The same way that we desire as men acknowledgement from any of our peers. Mm. Like for men to thrive, we need acknowledgement, right? We need to be just acknowledged for what we need to do to make sure that we're on the right track, to make sure that, okay, because I find that for men specifically, a question we're always asking is, is what I'm doing right now contributing to my goals and my purpose? And unless you get feedback from someone, you're just in the land of uncertainty. And it isn't until you start to realize that, okay, if if your dad, who you idealize as a hero, who shouldn't be in terms of hero myth and philosophy and stuff, they shouldn't actually be your hero, they need the acknowledgement more than you do. So it wasn't until that I really started like acknowledging my dad, I'd send him like a big, like, you know, thank you for providing, thank you for supporting, thank you for doing these and all these different things that um, we really like Mm. grew close. And it wasn't until he, he would feel it allowed him to have a space where he could be like, I can give love. Yeah, he could be validated. He, yeah, he could be validated. That respect. But you had to be yeah. mature enough to get to a point where you could actually see it like that. Yeah. 
and it was tough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it was, it just took like, it's sort of like a click when I started really focusing on health, personal development, physical health, mental health, everything like that, mm. where it wasn't until uh, I understood the power of love itself in, in general. And a real big click happened to me when it was, I just had the thought of people love being thanked. I mean, why do we do anything? I mean, Frederick Nietzsche has the, the line which he says, is it not the, um, I don't want to butcher it right now, but is it not the um, responsibility of the giver, the gift giver, to give thank you to the receiver for receiving? And that made a lot of sense to me. Cause like, why do you do anything for anyone else? Like, why do you do anything for anyone else? And a good job at it too, or high quality. It's to be thanked, mm. to recognize. Like if you have people over your house and you put on something nice, and say, thank you, this was really nice. To that be makes seen, you feel good. because we want connection and we want to feel like we matter. 100%. Mm. So I started thinking, okay, so for anyone who receives me, how can I thank them for that? And am I doing enough to be received properly? So I would be as sincere as sincere as possible because a gift that you can give to someone is verbally acknowledging them like the if you look at the five love languages one of them is words of affirmation which has a big result for people so i would thank people as best as possible as sincere as possible would think about things that i truly appreciate not just like oh flattery mm. um it's like no what can i truly appreciate about someone so i'd i'd send that to my dad i'd call him we'd talk about it and sometimes people watch him like <laughs> pop up his chest and stuff and I was like awesome and now dad, yeah. like dad's like my best friend so ah wow yeah. that's cool that's mm. it. and that's a good thing for people to hear because there's so many young men have strained relationships with their dads where they have a, a stoic dad just like you've described and have a past like that and probably think oh there's no way we could fix it or that's just the way we are and just by you sort of being the, the bigger man or coming to that realisation you actually fully changed that relationship which yeah. is pretty incredible because that then for your own validation is massive and knowing that you have a healthy relationship with your father is that's pretty big for your own story and and i think you understood that we don't know what it's like yet but having a son and raising a son as a man that's like your that's your ultimate thing that you did in life so if you feel like that didn't work or it's not it's not being um appreciated that's a pretty big strike on everything for you, isn't it? Like it must feel that way. So then to have that turn around and say, no, actually you, you did a great job and I love you. That's makes sense that that means everything. hundred percent. And I put myself just in my dad's position. And I just, I just played with this thought, thought process for a while. I was like, okay, if you're a dad, how are you honestly going to feel like for your kid? You're just going to want the best. You want them, but you're going to want them to be tough because you know that the word the world out hard. there is hard. Yeah. And they've, you've had to overcome some things. Either it could be relationships, could be divorce, could be business stuff. It could be um, what, what, whatever it is. Yeah, you're just life's like, going to happen. Yeah. This kid needs to be tough. He needs to work hard. He needs to find success. He needs to be out there on his own. So I need to set an example. Mm. Watch me self-sacrifice. Don't worry about the family. I won't even spend like time with them because I'm too busy working. I'm too busy doing mm. this. This is what it takes to have all these things. And it's like, well, work smarter, not harder. And like my dad did that. And like I didn't, there was like, I just remember that every single night dad would rock home at like 7.30, like right before I'd go to bed or yeah. 8 p.m. Like as a kid, I remember that like whole period. And I wouldn't have like get to spend much time with him because he was always working and self-sacrificing so that he could, look, we have all these nice things though. Yeah. But, and I think that's like a very common thing. And it isn't until I put myself like in those positions, that position when I was like, how am I ever going to get out of that? How am I not going to do that for like my own kid? Like, especially if I do have a son, it's like, how are you going to show him that that's not the way to and, go and about it? And realizing that you have an opportunity to actually create a life where there'll be a, a different possibilities that didn't exist for your dad and don't exist for most people as well. But that's sort of the, the golden goose sort of scenario that, everyone would want but it's not necessarily easy to to create that but your mental health really spiraled when you were in your early 20s though when you yeah. were at your mum's uh-huh yeah yeah tell sure, me about sure that i did so um i was suicidal for a while and had some serious suicidal tendencies i remember it was for me what it looked like was i'd wake up every single day i'd get in the car to either drive to uni or drive to work and i'd essentially have tears in my eyes just thinking to myself i don't want to be here i'd wake up in the morning i don't want to be here i'd be driving to work i don't want to be here i'd get to work i'd be like i don't want to be doing this i'd be trying to study i'd be like 
this is not what I want to be doing. And that thought was just persistent, sort of Cons- tainting everything. So consistent, man. I'd go to bed and be like, thank God I get to go to sleep so I can just shut it off for a while. Mm. It was just like consistent for like two months. But that was like the longest two months ever, two, three months. What was happening with ever. like your friends and your relationships and stuff at that time? So essentially what happened was I put all my worth and identified myself um, – for being like a good boyfriend because I had a girlfriend that like I really valued and I thought she was like awesome and I made a mistake that a lot of men do and I I believe in through reading a lot of theories uh, there's a book called uh, Wild at Heart and it sort of breaks out a man's life into three different areas and that is beauty, purpose and danger and to have a well-balanced life is you need a well-balanced model with those three things. If you focus too much on beauty the girl like pisses off. If you focus so much on danger, you're going to hurt yourself. And if you focus so, too much on purpose, the later on throughout your life you get, you'll realize that you are alone. Yeah. So you've got to have that equilibrium and then you've got to water the whole garden. Oh, yeah. But you only, <laughs> yeah. you only learn as you go on. Don't you? <laughs> exactly. So I made the mistake of focusing way too much on beauty and her. Mm. And there were so many things in terms of um, when you start researching into masculine and feminine energy, yeah. when I was like, Putting oh. Putting her on the pedestal. Oh. And saying all the things that totally, yeah. totally kill the uh, yeah, attraction. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember doing like her assignment for her. I know. For it's, terrib- it's terrible like, when you think back to some of the stuff. Oh, and you're like, oh, oh man, God. That was so simple. <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, like simple life, goddamn. Yes, yeah. yeah, so there were so many lessons there that were that that were learned, but were necessary to learn. But you know, it's not like at that mm. stage I didn't have a good relationship nah. with dad, so I couldn't rely on him to ask him for anything. Yeah, and sort of like, you know, how do I deal with these things, and how do I be an inspiring leader, and how do I be a man in this in these situations? But mm. we live and we learn. Yeah, so that broke down. Yeah, so that but we ended up breaking up, and it was bad because I attached myself to her because I made her the like the. Yeah. The, which the is the a purpose. which is a surefire way to make sure it'll end. <laughs> I would do it every single time, yeah. and that just got me down. Gen- generally, it was just like you know, normal. As everyone has had their heart broken, those was like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like the worst. You know, you feel a bit sick. Um, but then everything else started like spiraling down as well. Um, it was it was so necessary to happen at the time. But I was like, okay, now she's disconnected. I don't know my purpose. I didn't have any healthy danger. I was at uni, uncertain if that was the right path. My relationship with my mum wasn't good, um, wasn't living with dad and we weren't talking too much at the time because I'd like, just stop working with him and all different things. My job that I had at the like part-time in a surf store was like the worst, the culture was bad and like I couldn't, at that time for how I was, how much work I did on myself, I couldn't seem to do anything right. And I was like, it was because you're not on the right job, not doing the right stuff, so of course you're going to like, like, it wasn't passionate, wasn't anything and everything just started going bad. U- uni grades, which I used to be pretty good, started falling down as well. And it was like, oh my goodness, like what what is happening? Like I'm a failure, I mm. suck, mm. Is nothing, no one's fault but my own, I should just crawl into a hole and fucking die. Yeah, and then so, that, that just feeds and breeds more of that it festers mm. it festers and um it's sort of like the book crime and punishment that Fyodor dostoevsky wrote and if you read that book which i recommend everyone do but understand it might take you like six months because that is a hard book to read is he is i can really relate to you know and jordan, jordan peterson talks about a lot as well it's sort of just like when you start going down the dark side it's very easy to keep going yeah. and especially if you don't take any responsibility and that's essentially what i was doing and in the book, Crime and Punishment, it shows how this guy is he's super sick. He's got a bad relationship with his family. He's got a bad relationship with his uni degree and, and all these other different things. And he's like, oh, it's all their fault if only blah, 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 blah. And then he kills somebody and like immediately regrets it and then tries to hide all the things and then um, unconsciously puts himself in a position where he was more likely to get caught so that he can, you know, repent because he feels so guilty for it. Mm. And a sort of the same sort of thing like model was like, put on myself at that time and you know i'd feel guilty for the things i was just kept making bad decisions and not taking any responsibility for stuff Mm. and and then you have low energy and then you don't do anything positive and then that makes you feel guilty and feel bad and then you just get caught in that loop shame embarrassment guilt um unworthy you don't feel like an individual you feel like less of a man um and you also don't have a particular reason to be able to hinge it on 
which just makes you feel more guilty about it because it's like how would i even explain this to someone like and, and then we've been taught the language of oh you're just being a bitch or like yeah just fucking get over exactly it and you'd say yeah. those things to yourself like just get the fuck over it mm. and especially if growing up to be like put on a pedestal like you're gonna be a singer dancer and actor yeah it was like in um sort of like what as if this is happening to me like yeah. i had all of these talents yeah. and all these kind of like things. you were entitled for something else to happen super entitled felt yeah. super uh, super entitled so it wasn't until that i started researching and learning all this stuff um and just having the courage just to t- I'm like, i need to tell somebody so i'm not going to do anything mm. and just in that crazy just sort of real bad headspace and i'd think about it and think about it think about it and it wasn't until i was like well this has been happening for a couple of weeks now i'm not going to do anything as bad as this is what do i do and i was like i just need to tell a friend I was it. I just need to tell somebody. Like I've done all the research. I've done all this stuff because I've been researching this for quite like a younger age. Always been interested in it. And I was like, I know what to do. And uh, when I was younger, I had a in in the early twenties period as well. Before that, girlfriend. There was another girlfriend I had, and she had a lot of mental health um, problems. And I'd been like in and out of mental hospitals and institutions, and listened to all these different things, and learned a lot about mm. um, anxiety and depression and schizophrenia and all these other different things which show up. So I knew what to do, and it was just to voice it and talk about it. Why were you worried about telling someone? Because I had to admit it to myself. Yeah. That was the hard part because you had to actually acknowledge, sort of like an alcoholic, I've yeah, got man. a problem. That's it. Or a sex addict, I've got a problem. Yeah. Because you spend, it a, you spend a period of time just sort of trying to wish it away mm-hmm. and hope that it would disappear because if it just would miraculously go away, then you wouldn't have to tell anyone else that, hey, uh, I've got an issue with something or I'm not perfect or this is going to change your image of me that I'm trying to betray. And we don't want to let that go because we like, oh, it would be a lot more convenient if it would just fix itself and I wouldn't have to feel awkward about the fact that I'm not invincible. Oh, yeah. But evidently that just leads you further down the dark path. A hundred percent. And is definitely in that position. Someone who lives has been in bodybuilding competitions, does all these things. It's like, ah, oh, I'm no, my goal is to be like, you know, a, a, an ideal individual who's, you know, sorted everything out. And it's like, Oh, I'm not. And now mm. I have to get vulnerable and people are going to like know me and really know me. Um, you know, especially as like, oh, come on, man, I'm, I'm too, too superior to have mental health problems. So What's this, going this on was here? happening when you were right into bodybuilding? Yeah, so I'd, I'd already competed in one bodybuilding show. Yeah. And this was sort of the thing that got me through it onto the next one was the second bodybuilding show. So you'd already put yourself show. out there publicly as like, I, I am the ideal that everyone <laughs> should shoot for. Look at this Adonis who yeah, doesn't yeah. have any weaknesses, yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and it's totally. like, yeah, so you do. On the surface and then... There's another element of certainly imposter syndrome there where you're projecting that image when you know that underneath it all was all, all hollow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bit of a mess around there. So So how'd that conversation go? Oh, man, it was like one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I was with my boy Wind, so shout out to my brother Wind because he helped me out big time. And I trusted him because he had had some serious mental health problems because his dad passed away when we were really young. So he really understood stuff. And he was one of my closest friends. And um, after going through that experience with him, all that stuff, his dad passing away, I was very close and comfortable about talking to these things with him. And I remember like just being like, as if it was like word vomit, as if like, as if, you know, before you tell a girl you like her, or what I imagine is proposing to someone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was that same level <laughs> yeah, of like stimulus. Hands are sweating but, and stuff. Yeah, but like negative. Cause I was like, oh my God, I'm going to tell him that all of this shit is real bad. And I remember like full freaking out. I felt so nervous and as if I was going to like throw up and I was like, wind, I have something to tell you, man. And he was like, what? And like a full choked up for like two minutes. And he's like, what, man? And I was like, bro, I don't want to be here. And like, what do you mean? It's like, I've been thinking about killing myself for the past month. And he was like, What? <laughs> And then we just sat down crying for like two hours because he was like, what are you doing, man? You got to be doing this. And just that simple act of like telling him and having a conversation about it and being able to let it out emotionally and actually cry and be vulnerable with another bro. which Acknowledge like, it. Which like you don't really like to do. How did that, how did that feel? Started the healing process. Um, at first, it was so scary and terrifying. It was like a plant medicine ceremony. Um, <laughs> it really was. It was so scary and terrifying. But then as soon as it started happening, it was just like waves of relief. How did that make you see the situation in a different light after you told someone else about it? I thought to myself, that was like all I needed to do was just bring it to the surface. There's some shit as dudes that we just 
push down. Mm. And as soon as I rose it up to the surface, all of this emotional stuff that I believe girls are a little bit more intuitive at than guys, it's a lot easier to just wipe it. And if I think personally to what I've researched in terms of different tribal stuff, religions and old school ways of how that men used to have initiation rites. Is we don't have that now. We don't have them anymore. Yeah. So being comfortable enough to do that was sort of like a forced initiation for me to be like, okay, big switch. And literally from there and one being knowing what that was like and being fearful of it mm. and two, understanding my goals and knowing that you can get and knowing that you can get them through seeing other stuff, doing it and trusting in yourself. Everything else in my life after that just went like mm. on a rate that I could never ever say beforehand. We're just gonna take a quick break to hear about a brilliant new podcast called Samson's Stronger that I really encourage you guys to go and check out. Often the hardest stories to tell are the ones that need to be told the most. This is an incredibly informative series focusing on the stories of child sexual abuse survivors and bringing the conversation forward on what's always been a taboo topic. Take a listen. What does it take? I always knew something was wrong, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. To grow stronger than your past. Because I knew if I spoke up, something bad would happen. What does it take for a man to overcome the sexual abuse he endured as a child? This is where resilience comes in. It was bringing about awareness that the suffering that survivors and victims of child sexual assault endure is nothing that anyone could describe. Of course, only we know. So for me, the more I talk about it, the less it becomes a secret. And that's the approach that I take, is to suck the energy out of the secret and it just becomes a story. From Samson, the Survivors and Mates Support Network, this is Stronger, sharing for the first time the courageous recovery stories of male survivors of child sexual abuse and their supporters. Samson's Stronger podcast, available at samson.org.au forward slash podcast and on your podcast app. So what became your purpose? So after that, so I started diving real deep into um, just a lot of philosophy stuff. And I really like Frederick Nietzsche. Nietzsche stuff was he just, Jordan Peterson talked about him a lot. And then I dove into him and then the way he talks about things and other philosophers talk about Nietzsche, it's like, oh, he's definitely got a real good mindset. Mm. And he was just like, the role of men is to like overcome yourself. And I really liked, I really liked that. It just sort of resonated, even the words resonated with me. So my purpose after that is like to consistently overcome myself and inspire other people to do the same. And to do so for sort of like this specimen, but putting yourself in that position in a healthy way, in a vulnerable way, as well as accepting all the dark and shadow parts of yourself and yeah. what really helps me. Addressing the whole package rather than just well, part of it. It's accepting yeah. it and bringing it in and understanding that, you know, as Carl Jung mentions, that that's the anima and that's the feminine side of yourself. A lot of it's the, where the darker side of yourself comes out of. And it's very interesting because I did this exercise with my mum when I realised a lot of the dark side of myself comes from a lot of her traits and it comes from all the bad qualities within her that I picked up. And it wasn't until I wrote all of these things down when to, to heal the relationship with my mum. I wrote all of these things down and I gave her a letter. And I was like, mum, I need to bring these to the surface so I can clear them because I'm holding so much resentment towards you. And it's yeah. like reducing the quality of my life. Um, and I was like, <laughs> I said to mum, like, hey, mum, this is a letter. Everything in here you already know. But we need to talk about this so that our relationship can be good because I need to so I can let it go. Yeah, and she was like bring it on <laughs> it's great because otherwise you just tiptoe around the elephant in the room and you can never move past anything but because those confrontations can be so uncomfortable the tendency is to just avoid it and avoid it and avoid it and both parties know that there's something there under the surface and that they're both ignoring it but they would rather just live in that lackluster space than confront it because they're afraid of what might happen if you actually did but you can never be free like that and I'm more scared of dying, living a life that, you know, wasn't full of love, joy and abundance um, than what I am of having a very confrontational conversation with my mum about all the dark stuff or my dad for that matter. Mm. So doing something like, you know, because you tell a lot of people sometimes, um, people of coach or whatever it is, I'll tell them something along the lines of, you know, you need to have a high quality conversation and a difficult conversation and it needs to be structured, it needs to be organized well and you need to talk about it. And you'd, you'd know the value of that, especially working in news and stuff sometimes, of, you know, you know, just how important and impactful it is to have like a really good conversation or a performance conversation. And having that helped 
clear so much stuff. And there was so much things in that, that conversation that I had with mum that I had no idea with her for why she is like she was. I remember me and my sister be like, why is mum like this? Why is she so frustrating all these different yeah. things? And I also and had And that's where compassion comes from, isn't it? And then I could be so much more compassionate to mum. Yeah. And it helps me understand. So instead of playing the victim and, and being like, or putting the blame on her, like, oh, well, whatever it is, and then feeling resentful to her, it's like, okay, how can you know I support mum or give her some love when she needs, when she really needs it? And when it. you have that resentment or that anger towards a, a parent or a loved one or a friend, whoever it is, it could just be that you don't understand them enough. Like, exactly. You know? And then you feel more guilty. And then that like weighs you down and it's a constant weigh down on you. And then like the same as going down that hole, as we mentioned beforehand, crime and punishment or down the hole of, you know, mental health problems and feeling dark is, you know, if you're not being a better person and you're, you know, you're not being sort of responsible, as I as mentioned beforehand, to your parents' feelings or something else, small things like being resentful at your mum or your, your dad or even just a friend because yeah. you don't understand them makes you feel like shit. It turns you into who you become as a person. Like It turns you into another person. If you're carrying that around, if you think, think of it as a, a physical weight or a dark cloud, it actually starts to erode the person that you believe you should be or that you need to be. And then you're not living in alignment with your values and then it all f flows into feeling real shit and then it's fucking <laughs> snowballs doesn't it yeah so for you, sure. you've got such an intense need to craft yourself into this man not just physically but through learning studying the emotional side of things spiritual side of things mental side of things do you think a large part of that is motivated by knowing how it feels to be real low and not wanting to go back there a hundred percent so i think that's like shadow work 101 what i like to do um is obviously understand all those things. And there's some people that I have talked to and um, some other coaches and people that we've had conversations, they're like, why would you want to focus on any of the bad stuff? And it's like, well, for me, it gives me the best motivation and excuse to go the other way. So I've got, if I can understand, as, and I'm fascinated by it, I remember like going to Europe and just being like, oh, I want to go see the Nazi camps. I want to see the death camps. I want to see all of these things. And I've read so many different like Nazis because I'm just interested in all the crazy stuff that humans can get into. Not just for the sake of being a victim, but also being someone, you know, like but being, how bad it can get. How bad yeah. it can really get. And then the the rose that grows between the pavement, which is the philosophy that comes out of that, like Nietzsche. And 100%. So understanding that on a real deep level is like, okay, so that's where I know what not to get towards. And then I understand the thoughts of when anything negative will pops up. I'm like, oh, that's a thought because of this, this, this can analyze it and let's not go down there. And then understanding as well how good everything can get. Understanding your goal is very clear. So you're not just getting pulled towards your goals. You're getting like pushed and pulled at the same time by understanding the dark side, understanding the light. And respecting it as and well. And knowing that yeah. actually you can end up there and you can stay there and you have to manage yourself and you have to put the work into making sure that you get where you need to go because that is a real risk that you'll end up somewhere terrible and you won't be able to get out of it. I know, right. And I'd like to ask the question, like, just feel like, like where do you go to figure out what the work is and how to do it? Uh, books are good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, other people who spent their lives thinking about this stuff that mm -hmm. definitely helps uh, other people who have their own thoughts and ideas that's sort of the best that you can 100 percent. <laughs> but you got to ask for it yeah that's right, right. It's you not have to like... be willing to accept and you have to admit that you don't that you don't know and that's okay and no one 100 percent does but yeah you have to be open to okay whatever i'm doing is not totally working for me and whatever way i need it i actually could use some help yeah, exactly. And you have to act actually have to actively search for it. Mm. When and the more you do, the less afraid you are and the more comfortable you feel inhabiting yourself and understanding that nothing that you're experiencing or going through hasn't been experienced by anyone else and that there's all these lessons out there that are available that you can teach yourself or not. <laughs> yeah, but imagine if like our dads understood all this stuff. Back to the dad thing again. And we were coached and mentored in it from a young age. Like, this is what's going to happen mentally. I believe that, like, and just for the stuff that I've looked at and from my own personal experience, is masculine energy is so strong. If you think about, like, our abilities to 
run ultra marathons and stuff like that and just how strong men are we can kill and fight monsters and figure out all these different systems we can you know, reproduce on crazy levels <laughs> and you know what it's like as a guy especially when you're growing up and you start first having sex and the energy that you have and the desire is just like crazy like no wonder if men aren't comfortable with that amount of energy that we have and we don't know how to go through the processes of maturing and understanding we don't channel it then it's going to show up in drugs porn sex overworking mental health problems addicted to danger addicted to doing stupid shit with the boys and having to like numb yourself because mm. it's, that is more comfortable than having to deal with this crazy amount of energy that we have as men and it isn't until we enhance it and focus and understand where it is and no one's taught us this like it's, well, our dads didn't know how would they know? They're just not like, it's not like they've gone and, like, they didn't have the internet. Mm. They couldn't go, oh, like, I'm feeling shit. How do I figure it out? Yeah. Haven't got Jordan Peterson and other people just like, I know he has such an incredible resource now to be able to do that so easily. My dad was great. Like, he was always super nurturing man, but he has learned this stuff in his older life. Like, since he was sort of like late 40s into his 50s, particularly, got really into like mindfulness and learning about meditation and all that sort of thing. And then he's always been a big reader. He's an English teacher since back in the day. So really built a wealth of knowledge and did a lot of study and figured out a lot about himself. But he he developed massively during the course of my life. And I know that he didn't used to know how to handle some of the feelings that he would have and the pressures that he was under and didn't know himself anywhere near as well as he does now and that those lessons have come later in life because he went looking for them and found them but harder because he couldn't just go on spotify and listen to whoever tell you not that you that means you then know the answers to life but it did fucking helps <laughs> <laughs> so true get yeah. on the joe rogan podcast yeah, yeah what a stud though like it's very I'm sure you can be really proud that oh he's yeah done those i was gonna things. ask you actually what do you what do you emulate from your dad me oh man uh, i'd say discipline big time workhorse mentality and that if you chase after something real hard on your focus all your energy you're going to get it but then also not holding back that inner lover side of ourselves that we have like i feel like a lot of men feel embarrassed to love yeah. and feel embarrassed to do things like i don't know many other people that like kiss their dads oh they're worried about how to be received uh, how to be viewed yeah. you're scared to be received like some awesome things like from dad some lessons that i learned was he was just like i don't care about stuff in terms of like christmas or birthdays and all these different things presents or whatever he's just like i just i just want to be loved and it wasn't that he said that that it was just like kind of a big click moment i'm like oh my god yeah of course you, you do. just want acknowledgement from your boy man. <laughs> yeah you just want acknowledgement from your boy you just want to know that he loves you and i was yeah. like oh, i can do that <laughs> yeah so oh, that's beautiful man yeah so how does one become the ultimate man with the will to dominate without letting it corrupt you real good question unsure where to start but my mind immediately goes to you know having some sort of structure and i believe for men in particular we're physical the sports and stuff we play we're used to being gladiators right sports wars going to the gym all different things that we do are very physical even yeah. when we're fucking it's all Ugh. it's natural for us we want to yeah we yeah. want action Exactly. It's uh, yeah, and that's why you watch action movies and all these different things. It's all like, ah, <laughs> right. Healthy testosterone is fantastic. I think it's the most beautiful thing in the world. And I think having a really good relationship with the physical side of yourself is super important because we get so much out of it. I always try to think of things ancestrally. And if we just rewind 1,500 years, whatever it is, we'd be fasting all the time. We would be finding, like having really high quality food and nutrients. We would be hunting and running and building and fixing. And we we're very in touch with our bodies. And if you look at all the tribals and religion stuff, men were super spiritual and they do things like fast. They do things like plant medicines. They do things like stillness retreats. There's always something. And sort we were of, together. And together. As a team. Man, yeah. Together. We had a real good community talking about different things and had initiation ceremonies where men would cry, do real, real tough things. And it was very clear, like, you are a man now or you're not. Exactly. You are part of the tribe. You yeah. are a necessary cog in the machine. Yeah. And I agree that that's definitely not anywhere near as well drawn out for people now where it's kind of like you meander around and like maybe you can find that somewhere if you're fortunate but it's not just given to you 100 percent. so i think all men should have their own personal goal of what they think for them would be you know their peak physical condition 
but then I always challenge people just to stretch it a little bit <laughs> in terms of like, and that's done. That gives you a really good healthy balance of, okay, if I need to be in peak physical condition, I need to have a good sleep routine. I need to be eating good food and I need to be exercising. Whatever's going to be best for you. I mean, that's super easy, right? Like that's in terms of learning a little bit about that. And well, then the rest of your life is likely to follow. And then also the discipline that you learn from maintaining that then flows on into the rest of your life. And you understand that things don't happen overnight and it becomes, okay, this is who I am as a person. I'm the person that gets up and trains. I'm the person that makes sure that I push through and I do something that's hard and I finish it anyway, because for my own self-respect, that's important. And that's just who I am and then that becomes your life whereas the opposite can be true as well where you say well I'm the person who says they're going to do something and then never does and then that voice in your head becomes negative and you're that person who always talks a big game but never follows through and then you think you're a loser and then that's a self-fulfilling prophecy it becomes true you mentioned a few things there and like there was a few things that you said that all hit the nail on the head in terms of just being like integral to your word and to be able to trust ourselves as and only you really know only you really ever know if you're being true to your word or not. No one else at does. At the end of the day. Like when you look in the mirror or you know within yourself, you can hide all sorts of shit from people and they will never know. But you will know. And that's self-worth right there. And to lose that is like a terrible, a terrible thing. Man, um, yeah, so true. And it's very funny how things sort of work when you see people get into relationships and stuff, especially... Um, like real intimate relationships when people get close to marriage and all these different things. And then throughout the whole marriage process of girls will always test you to how integral your word is. Yeah, yeah, I'll put the dishes away later. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll do this later or whatever it is. Mm. And then you haven't done this yet. You haven't done this yet. But then... Well, because can you be relied upon or not? Exactly. Mm. And then if you do that for yourself and if you can trust your own self, and because like, I find that like a, uh, a lot of people that I speak to, if just like the maturing process, becoming into like dads, the ones who are real good ones and who can be good dads and can provide, trust themselves because they've set certain goals and they've done certain things. And, and they well, are and they've proved to that to themselves. They have that... They have the evidence that they can back it up with where they say, all those times I said I was going to be this man, I, I followed through with it and I am. So I trust yeah. that. And that's the thing that I think keeps me largely out of trouble or certainly allows me to get back <laughs> on track um, is I ask myself that. I'm like, what does the man that I profess to want to be do in this situation? Do they go to this thing they don't want to do right now? Do they stop this behavior? Do they take this risk? The man that I feel I need to be, what do they do? And that's that's my compass. And I feel like I pretty much always do that because I know if I don't, I will not want to live with myself. Oh, it's so funny you said that, man, because I had a question that I wanted to ask you. And I also just wanted to say real quickly, it was like men's ability to trust in themselves validates their ability to be a good dad and to be worthy enough to reproduce. When I understood that, blew my mind. The other question that I wanted to ask you in terms of that question that you asked me in terms of being the ideal and stuff, I was like, okay, well, if you just closed your eyes and you pictured the best version of yourself in terms of just what does he look like and what does he do? I'm assuming majority of men would close their eyes and they'd be like, well, he'd be fit. He'd look responsible. He'd look competent and strong. He'd be a man of his word. And he'd be a man of his word. A hundred percent. And people yeah. people would want to be around him. And yeah. Yeah. They explain that in the book, Origins of History of Consciousness and King Warrior Magician Lover. And there was a term that Eric Erickson used called um, a generative man. And it's like being in the position where all the people around you can benchmark themselves of what it means to be like a good person off of you. Mm. And that's like a really awesome, proud place to be in. Um, that wasn't out of mm. origin history of consciousness, just to correct myself. That was out of King Warrior Magician Lover and it was an Eric Erickson quote. It's a great quote. And so, they'll yeah. probably tell you or you probably would get an inkling if you are that person or not. Yeah, that's a good goal to have. Yeah. Um, yeah, am I the man I want to be? And knowing that every choice you make and your daily habits – uh, they all add up and they all count towards that picture. Uh, and there's no there's no single choice that is inconsequential in the weight that it carries. It doesn't mean like you have to fucking do the right thing 100% of the time, but you need to take ownership and, and understand your own agency that 
if things aren't going how they should be going and you're not happy about it, you can probably trace that back to the fact that you haven't been you haven't been accountable like you know you should and that you're lying to yourself if you think it's someone else's fault or like you have been, you know. You always, no matter what situation in situation you're in, take your fair share of responsibility and you can create a space for all of those around you to be themselves. Mm. Uh, I'm reading a great book at the moment called Courage is Calling by Ryan Holiday, which is really cool. His new one. Yeah, his new one. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it's awesome, man. Um, and there's just like, there's so much good stuff in it. He said, every hero faces the same choice to wait and be saved or to stand and deliver. And that's just that's just fundamental like for, for all of us as far as the hero's journey, which we all have to go on whether we like it or not. It doesn't mean it's going to end up well, but that's the choice it's like are we going to wait to be saved is it going to be someone else's problem are we going to blame are we going to be the victim or are we going to assert our own agency and say well it comes down to me at the end of the day i am the only one who can pull myself out of this as much as other people can help you and as much as you need to invite other people into that journey like it's on it's on you and i think so many people are terrified by that reality and try to pretend like it's not true or distract themselves by being part of some other movement or whatever it is because they're afraid of their own mortality and they're afraid that actually it's all up to them and if it's not going how they'd like it's actually their fault yeah yeah man i love that so much i love how you touched on that and there's an art there's a Nietzsche quote that I think you probably know, which is that there are no beautiful surfaces without a terrible depth. I didn't know that one, and that is so good. I'm yeah. devastated that I didn't know that which, one. Which, <laughs> uh, yeah, I got you. I'm, I'm <laughs> you win this round, <laughs> Feels good, feels good. But basically meaning that pain actually equals happiness in the end, and that to have that beauty on the surface means that underneath you had to go through plenty and you have to know the darkness before you can really relish the the light on the other side of it and that's part and parcel like the yin and yang you you need to know both and then then you can be free i think 100 percent. and just another Nietzsche quote is everyone's heard of this quote but just staring into the abyss the abyss stares back if you look into all the dark side of yourself um it's going to show up and it's there unconsciously or consciously regardless but unless you do something about it um you never get to you know really accept and like yourself because there's some stuff that i sort of think about just in terms when i think about my parents and you know there's other people for parts of themselves that they don't like and it isn't until that they and it could be bad mental health because you know when you have bad mental health or you're depressed or anxious you get embarrassed that you have those and that you don't like them and it isn't until that you accept those things that you can really start to you know integrate yourself and and be proud of yourself and understand that they're there Mm. the same way we're symbiotic with uh, the bacteria that lives in our stomach it's the same way that we're it's all it's all all part of the same picture yeah it's all connected and we know that our our fears pretty much point us in the right direction of where we should go so what are you afraid of now like me in general. Yeah, what are you afraid of? Oh, that's a really good question. I haven't thought about that for a little bit. Um, I think it's just a lot of just the standard one that a lot of men feel and that it is like not succeeding. And in my position at the moment, when I reflect, I'm doing pretty well and I'm on a real good trajectory and I'm progressing faster than I've ever progressed before and I'm completely responsible for myself and everything's awesome. But there's still just this sort of that thing a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs can have is like, oh, what if I don't succeed? look like Mm. you know what i mean it's just reflecting on that but i catch myself on it very regularly um but that would probably be one and then like what is what is success to you as well so well it's just freedom it's just the standard thing for i think all guys can sort of have freedom safety it was really cool um a book warren farrell and john gray wrote called the boy crisis redid maslow's hierarchy for men in particular and the first thing that men should have before they thrive is like safety but i sort of and there was another one in there that they had which was sort of how the world puts the hierarchy on us and i can't remember what it was but i remember that the safety was like quite up and i remember looking at it and being like I kind of rise to the challenge for this because even though that the hierarchy should be safety first for men to to feel really well, it's just not how it is currently. And we sort of really 
hate the man up attitude, but sort of if we can take responsibility for ourselves and we can get there, um, and if other people can do it, like you can too. And I would say that admitting your fault and telling people that you need help is actually manning up. Oh, hundred percent. Yes, that's like yeah, like you. And and that's the that's the misconception there where we think that's complaining or it's doing the opposite, but actually. It's completely necessary in order for you to function and be as an effective man as you can possibly the, be. You have to do it. The more vulnerable you are, the more powerful you are. Mm. The more you integrate your shadow, the more people can not have anything against you. Because the only thing that's going to prevent you from getting to certain areas is just like your your opinion of what other people's opinion have on you. Mm. There is people that like I work with and, and, and that I know like this example happens, right? Let's say they're trying to quit drinking. I believe that I'm not going to drink was their thought, right? But I'm not going to put myself in social situations where there's going to be drinking in case I fail purely because other people doubt my ability to not drink and because of their opinion for me that doubting me to drink is more likely going to make me drink. Mm. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why? You know what I mean? But that's very common. And then I started thinking about that for other things that, you know, I'd commit to all these things that could be success. Mm. And you know what I mean? And like your motivation to do certain things or not jump onto this because you're fearful of someone else's opinion of what they might think of you or how they're, you know, maybe you won't achieve success or you'll fail in this thing, whatever. And then you'll never take that chance or you never do that. Thing. And also thinking that everyone else actually gives a fuck yeah no one does <laughs> so the more vulnerable you are i was getting back to it, the more vulnerable you are with everything the more you disable that and then the more you can believe in yourself so and I the less you can be hurt because it's like yeah i already acknowledge those things within myself and i've already been working on those insecurities and so if you're going to hold them in front of my face they're not going to hurt me because i've already been looking yeah. at them real closely you and know? i love them you get to the point where you love all those things mm. and you love all that that funny stuff i think about all the stupid stuff that i've done and it's like well if you can forgive yourself everyone else is going to forgive you as well like <laughs> yeah. and yeah embracing those i think is really important and the, every time that i have been vulnerable since has been another stepping stone or a little initiation something where i've had so much support and so much good feedback for any sort of self-progress that I have and how to actually do that for someone who's listening because we can talk about all these things right and talk about oh integrating yourself and learning these things and doing the inner work what does that actually look like mm. buy a big piece of paper and write them all down and then circle them and be like this is something shit I think about myself or this is a part of myself. And that, that works for men yeah. because we like to just map it out and yeah. make it all real logical. And you actually, yeah. Yeah. And then tell someone about it. Be like, look, yeah. at, look at these shit things about myself. Am I correct here? And I'm like, yeah, dude. You're heaps bad in that. And you're like, oh, that's great. Then you like have a conversation and, yeah. you know, really accept it and understand that, you know, a lot of us are all in the same position. Uh, where can people find out more about you, bro? Sweet, man. Um, head to, I just say head to my Instagram. Corey Boutwell, or just one word and Corey with an E. I have a website, CoreyBoutwell.com, and I have my own podcast, which is just Corey Boutwell Podcast. So uh, they're the bad boys. Have you got a gem to leave us on? <laughs> um, let's have Don't a... tell me you're out of quotes, bro. <laughs> I know. One more. All right, okay, there's a real good one. Just I really like Viktor Frankl's quote, and he was like, of someone that was in the Nazi camps, and he was dealing with all like the, the crazy stuff, and he's quite, I don't, I don't want to butcher it, but it was something along the lines of, live life now as if you're living life for the second time, and you are about to act right now as wrongly as you were about to act for the first time. Let that sink in. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Your decisions matter. All right. We'll leave it there, bro. Big love, bro. <laughs> That's it for this episode. If you're getting some value out of the show, please help us out with a quick rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Everything we do is recorded in video, so follow Young Blood Men's Mental Health on Instagram and Facebook and Young Blood Mental Health on TikTok. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Young Blood Media, and please leave us a comment or send us a message if these stories resonate. We'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, please share the podcast with anyone in your life who might need it. We're all about reaching as many people as we can. This is Youngblood. Thanks for being part of the mission. Catch you next time.